Brother Al was certainly correct that the people of God ought not to be stupid. Amen. Complete love demands complete truth. Anything else is an injustice to the flock of God. 1 John was a letter written by a preacher who truly loved the church. This apostle of Christ Jesus, an elder in Christ's body, the church, loved the flock enough to tell them the truth, even if at times it hurt their human pride. John is most commonly referred to in the world today as the apostle of love. Almost exclusively, that is because of the number of times which love is mentioned within his writings. Now the false teachers of our day, they like to quote from John's writings frequently, lifting up love of the brethren as a banner under which we are to blindly tolerate the false teachings of this world. But if the apostles' works were studied in greater detail, the truth is that there is no New Testament writer who makes a stronger ethical demand than the Apostle John. Nor is there an Apostle who more strongly condemns false teachers who lead the flock astray. The reason the first epistle of John has come about is because of the attack by false teachers against the truth of God. Claiming to be Christians, denominational groups such as the Gnostics, the Docetics, they were presenting a false gospel. Written at the end of the first century, Christianity by that time was in its second and third generation. The thrill of the initial days of the church were to some extent fading. To put that in layman's terms, the honeymoon period was over. In the first generation church, there was a, a glorious splendor that accompanied being a part of this new movement. But you see, the passing of the first generation Christians accompanied with great persecution caused the church to become more traditional and half-hearted. In other words, they fell into routines. Jesus predicted this would happen. In Matthew 24, he says many false prophets will arise. They'll mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. Now, John was writing to Christians living in just that time period. And his encouragement comes because Christianity demanded a standard of moral purity and faithfulness that was indeed difficult. Now, John does not deal with the subject of persecution as did Peter in his epistles. Instead, when you get right down to the bottom line, John deals with the topic of seduction. False teachers seducing true Christians. You see, the trouble didn't come from men who were bent on destroying the Christian faith. That's the, that's the catch. It came from those who thought they were improving it. Those false teachers, they knew the intellectual tendencies of the day. And they felt it was time for Christianity to step up and come to terms with secular philosophy and contemporary thought. Oh, they knew all the right things to say. They talked about being born of God, walking in the light, having no sin, dwelling in God, knowing God. See, those were the catchphrases, and they knew how to banter them about at the right time. And really, they had no intention of destroying the church. In fact, by their way of convoluted thinking, they wanted to cleanse the church of the dead wood and make Christianity an intellectually respectable philosophy fit to stand beside the other great philosophical systems of the day. Back to truth. 
The truth is, the effect of their teaching was to deny the incarnation, to eliminate the Christian ethic, and to make real fellowship with the body of Christ impossible. So it's no wonder that John comes forward and strives so hard to defend the church that he loves from such an insidious attack from within. You see, this was a threat even worse than that of persecution. And truly, the very existence of the Christian faith was at stake. In John's first epistle as a whole, he introduces two pieces of evidence in particular which help us to identify the true Christian. One is sonship or being recognized as legitimate children of God. The other is fellowship, which deals with our responsibilities within the Christian family. You see, still today, we have many who claim to be children of God. Many who claim to be in fellowship with us. Well, how do we know what's real? John offers the same three conditions repeatedly throughout this letter. The same three tests for both sonship and fellowship. And those three tests are truth, love, and obedience. The text that we are going to examine in detail this evening is 1 John 4.19. Translated directly from the Greek New Testament, John says this, We love because he first loved us. Now this verse is one of several key passages within the letter that have to do in truth with both sonship and fellowship. So let's examine the text in greater detail so that we can come to a better understanding of true Christianity, of real fellowship in Christ, and ultimately, the love of God. Starting in first chapter, the first verse of chapter 4, the contrast is being made between true teachers and false teachers. In verse 5, for example, of chapter 4, John says, they are from the world. Therefore, they speak. As from the world, the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the subject of the first six verses of the chapter is truth. And you know, John certainly doesn't seem to display the tolerance that seems to be the watchword of the contemporary religious world. In fact, in what seems to be a most narrow manner, John, speaking as an apostle, says, We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we know the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. Boy. That's cutting it pretty hard, John. Thus, the apostolic message as a whole is openly being declared as the only truth. Anything that stands opposed to or disagrees with the apostles' doctrine is rightly to be identified as false good, no matter how good it sounds. Then, setting up in chapter 4 from the subject of truth, beginning in verse 7, the author moves to the subject of love. He doesn't leave the subject of truth. He adds the subject of love and shows specifically love's connection with the truth. By the time we get to verse 19, we hear this, we love because he first loved us. What does that verse mean? Considering the context of the chapter, we speaks of the true Christians to whom this letter is addressed. 
You go through the book of 1 John and you see such language as beloved, children, brethren. We know exactly to whom John is writing then. According to what we've read just in chapter 4 up to verse 19. The one he's speaking to is the one who has tested the spirits to see whether they're from God. The one who knows God and listens to the apostles' teaching. The one in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. The one in whom there is no fear because they're abiding in the love of God. That's the one to whom John's writing. We love. In the introduction to this meeting, Brother Mike said that part of what we're going to do is define God's love. Now in English, love is to be understood by context. If I say to my wife, I love you. If I say to Brother Mike, I love you. If I say to my son, I love you. I've said the same thing three times, and in all three senses, I mean something different. I don't mean exactly the same thing. But boy, sometimes that makes it tricky. But in the Greek language, things were in fact clear. Because there are four words that can be translated into English as love. At the most base level, there is eros, or sexual love. Storge refers to a family-oriented and protective love, such as the love between a parent and a child. Phileo, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Phileo, we, owe, we, we call brotherly love most often. It speaks of affection and caring, and it doesn't have any regard to family relationship. But then there is that Greek word agape that does have to be dealt with, and that's the word translated love within our text. Commonly, and by commonly I mean in the religious world today, this word is defined as godly or benevolent love. That's the common definition. I even read one PhD, of course that didn't impress me much. I read one PhD and he said every, I better read this just so I get it right, I wouldn't want to misquote the fella. Every usage of agape in the New Testament has to do with God's amazing love. Now that sounds good, but it's wrong. It's wrong. The reason agape is most often defined as godly or benevolent love is because, well, that's the word the New Testament writers use regarding God's love a majority of the time. But such definitions, although popular, don't stand up under careful scholarship. For example, consider John chapter 12, verse 43. Some of the Jewish rulers believed in Jesus, but they wouldn't publicly support him. Why? The Bible says they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Same word, agape. And it's describing the selfish love of mankind. John 3, 16, my goodness, it's a popular verse. Don't worry whoever's preaching that. I'm not going to go on to it. God so loved the world, agape. Three verses later, John 3, 19, same word. We're told that men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Same word. So in the second case, we certainly can't describe that as godly or benevolent love. We also find this conflicting usage within the Apostles' doctrine. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, Well, Demas, he loved this present world and he deserted me. Peter, in 2 Peter 2, he talks about Balaam. Oh, he loved the wages of unrighteousness. Well, certainly in either the case of Demas or, or Balaam, can we say that that's godly or benevolent love? So we've got to put together some evidence to determine what this word agape means. Now certainly, I, wanna, I just want to get something straight before I go any farther. Certainly, not every Christian needs to know Greek. 
but I'm glad some do. You wouldn't be holding those English translations you have in your hand if they didn't. And I'm thankful for men like Brother Seth who have spent so many years teaching the Greek language and translating the scriptures. Now, this base word, eros, not used once within the New Testament. This family word, storge, only used a few times, but only in combination with other words, never on its own. Phileo, now it's used a few dozen times, so it's got some usage, but agape, now that's used hundreds of times in the New Covenant. So since the New Testament writers have chosen to use this word so often, maybe we better come to a definite conclusion as how to explain it. Well, lacking great Greek knowledge, maybe the best way to understand agape love then is to see what that love has prompted an individual to do. In one case, we were told, God so loved the world. In the other case, we were told that Demas loved this present world. Boy, that sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? It's not. You see, the actions of God and Demas were exactly opposite of one another, even though it's the same word. God loved the world, and he gave his son as a sacrifice. Demas loved the world and took off from Paul. One word but two polar actions. So might I suggest this as a definition of agape love. It is a willful love. It is a compelling love. A motivating love, if you will. Let me give you an example of this. In Luke eleven forty three, Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees! You love the front seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. There's our word agape. But see those Pharisees of whom Joseph, of Jesus spoke? Prestige is what they loved. That was what motivated them. That was what compelled them to do what they did. An apostolic example of this is found in 1 John 2, 15. He says, do not love the world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So properly defined then, we should not be motivated or compelled by the world or the things of the world. If we willfully choose to love earthly things, then that's because we've willfully rejected heavenly things. The compelling love of God is not found within one who is instead compelled by the world. Now back to our text. We love because. Hey, every word means something. And because tells us there's a reason why we love in this specific manner. Now certainly, there are always motivating factors behind each kind of love. Eros is motivated by desire. Storge, it's motivated by the family bond. Phileo is, is motivated by camaraderie and philanthropy. But agape love, that's special. That is the defining love of our life. In John 15, 19, Jesus says, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Now, is that the word agape? Nope, not in this case. It's the word phileo. If you were of the world, the world would have a brotherly love towards you. Now, wait a minute, no agape? Uh-uh, not in this case. What that tells us is this. It doesn't matter how popular you are. It doesn't matter how much power you got. The world is never going to love you as much as you love the world. Why is that? Because a selfish world doesn't have any capacity for anything greater. Amen. The world's already given their agape love to other things. They've got no agape love to give you. Consider a worldly man. He has a physical relationship with his wife, Eros. He attends his kids' school and sporting events, Storge. He spends Friday night at the bar with his friends. Phileo. Yet for this particular man, oh, it's his job that compels him. 
that which motivates and drives his life, that which receives his agape love is his work. Now let's shift our attention to a heavenly man. A heavenly man also has a physical relationship with his wife. He also spends time with his children. He spends time with his friends. But in this situation, it is the love of Christ which compels him. That's what motivates that man. Now, by the way, Brother Ricky, I loved your message. And especially what you said about your compelling love. Doing the will of God. That's what drives you. That's what motivates you. That's the kind of agape love we're talking about this evening. Now, in either case, doesn't matter whether we're talking about the earthly man or the heavenly man. That which compels and motivates and dominates the will is going to affect every other relationship. That's the way it goes. Amen. But in our case, as sons of God, according to our text, we love because God first loved us. You know, sometimes it's a good thing to be able to compare different translations of the scriptures. It can bring new insight to a particular text. But then again, there are times when it can be a little confusing. And this text is one such example in truth. For example, I found five Bible versions which furnish a direct object to the verb. They translate the, the text as, we love him because he first loved us. I found a couple others that says we love others because he first loved us. Now, wait a minute. Do we love him or do we love others? Well, now, hold on. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. I know you're already moving way ahead of me. See there? Now, I might just strike that out of my notes. What if, what if the apostle said exactly what he meant to say without a direct object. Oh, we do love God because he first loved us. And we do love others because God first loved us. But what if this text isn't necessarily about loving God specifically or loving others specifically, but about our ability to truly love at all? At the beginning of this message, I mentioned that John's three criteria for those who truly our Christians are truth, love, and obedience. But see, here's the catch. Unless God had taken the initiative, we would have never known the truth of God or the love of God or the commands of God to be obedient to. And I think that's where we really see the key behind 1 John 4.19. This is about the divine revelation of proper motivating love. We love because he first loved us. If God would not have first loved us, we never would have known what true love was. Without his example, all we would have is the loves of the world. Now I know eros is good enough for the worldly marriage, but see, it's not good enough for God. That's why he introduced agape love into the marriage relationship when in Ephesians 5.25 he says, Husbands, love agape your wives just as Christ loved agape the church. Without divine revelation, hey, all we would know is storge love within our families. But God introduced us to a more intimate relationship that can exist between parent and child. Matthew 3.17, he says of his son, this is my beloved son, agape, Amen. in whom I'm well pleased. And see, we watch. We watch the relationship between the father and the son, and now we have a better pattern to build our own family relationships on than what we see in the world. The same thing's true of friendship. Without God's divine intervention, all we would know is phileo. Now, folks, I'll tell you right up front, phileo is the dominant love of religion today. Not agape, phileo. God revealed to us something greater through his son. He gave us a friendship that exceeds the world's capabilities. For example, in John 11, we're told that Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus, agape. In John 13, referring to the Apostle John, it talks about 
There was reclining on Jesus' breast one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, agape. So now we have something different because the world doesn't know anything but phileo love, friendship. God is introducing us to something greater. Now, agape is the real confusion. It really is. Especially concerning some of those verses I introduced you to earlier. Because man has its own form of agape love. Those who love darkness rather than the world. Hey, when a man loves himself more than anything else, that's agape love. When a woman that goes out there and puts her career ahead of everything else, that's agape love. When the Donald Trumps of this world go pursue their money and their property to the exclusion of everything else, that's agape love. But it's not the agape love we're talking about. It is the tendency of the sinful nature to want to pull back to the base things of the world. You see, Satan, he, Satan wants our minds full of eros love. Oh yeah, that's what Satan wants. He wants to convince us there's no harm in fantasy. He wants you to believe that the love you see portrayed on TV is the right kind of love. Satan's thrilled when people develop an agape love for sex. Because if sex is your motivating factor, you belong to Satan. He's also urging us towards storge love. He wants you to stay home from church when the relatives come for a visit. He's out there teaching you that you've got to cater to your children's whims. Oh, they've got to be involved in every sporting event and every school activity. Don't you love them that much? Oh, when it comes to church, well, we've got to entertain them so they'll come to church. Don't you want what's best for your children? You see, Satan's busy. He wants the love of the family to become, for some, an agape love. He would rather see you motivated by family than by God. Satan's also busy pushing us toward a phileo love. He wants us to be friendly with our neighbors. He wants you to put on a smile. Now, don't offend anyone. Just be a good Joe, you'll be fine. Boy, I tell you, the devil has especially espoused this doctrine among the churches of the day. Well, now, preacher, don't go saying anything about those other churches in town. We're all neighbors, you know. What do you mean we don't know how to love, preacher? Didn't we just deliver a box of canned goods to the Salvation Army just last week? Didn't we give a big box of presents to those orphans last Christmas? What do you mean we don't know how to love? Oh, and I can just hear, I can hear Satan saying, oh, you tell that preacher. How dare he tell you what love is? See, the devil wants good works, charitable donations to become your agape compelling love. After all, feeling righteous is such a good, uh, a good substitute for being righteous, isn't it? Yeah, that's what the world wants. But all this time that the devil's pushing us toward these worldly loves, then we have God. And God is urging us toward a different agape love, a different compelling motivated love that's only found in the truth of God, the love of God, and obedience to his commands. That's it. Such love goes beyond anything that this world has to offer. Boy, you talk about confusing people. I can just see the, 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 the wheels uh, running on empty cylinders when Jesus sat there and said, well, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, you shall love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Agape love? Our enemies? Are you sure? See, the world won't go that far, but God will. So the question becomes, who are you going to trust to teach you what agape love is? Are you going to trust God or are you going to trust the world? you got to make a choice. Amen. Every person, let me stress this again. Brother Ricky, I know it's sort of trademark, can, but can I pound on the pulpit for a minute? Every person develops an agape love. Every person. Everyone. We all have one love that motivates us more than any other. Such love is either based in self, 
or it's based in God. You either love earthly things or you love heavenly things. But you are going to make a choice. Luke 16, 13. Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. He's either going to hate the one and love agape the other, or he's going to hold the one and despise the other, but you can't serve God and mammon. Such a choice has always been required of men, folks. This is nothing. Jesus didn't come along with anything new. I know that some of the Jews of Jesus' day were just bamboozled, like, wait a minute, where, where'd that come from? Well, if they just paid attention to their own law, they would have seen these things from long ago. Oh, our brother talked about it this morning. Genesis 22, God saying to Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love, and go to the mountain and sacrifice him. You see, now Abraham had a choice. His son or God. God wanted to know if Abraham loved the family more than he loved him. In Genesis 29, boy, we're told that Jacob loved Rachel. Well, what did that love compel him to do? He worked 14 years for her. In Exodus 20, the command of God finally just put an end to all the waffling, and he forced men to choose. He said, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commands. There's the choice. And for the true Christian, the choice is an easy one. Because we have set our minds on things above, not on the things on this earth. And why have we turned our attention fully to loving God rather than to fully loving the world? Our text explains for us because he first loved us. We love because he. He refers to God. He's the one who first loved us. He's the reason we love. Without him, we never would have known what real love was. Without his intervention, all we'd have is a godless, earthly version of agape love. But we love because he first implies order. Specifically, our text, he first loved. 1 John 4.10, the first text of the day said, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. You see, when we compare man to God, God was the first one to love. Amen. God was the first. Jesus vocalized this himself in John 17, 24. Thou didst love me before the foundation of the world. Let's see a man beat that one. Eventually, here's what's really great. Here's where our hope from, comes from. Eventually, God also expressed that eternal love toward created man. In the next two verses of that John 17 passage, verses 25 and 26, Jesus speaking to his father says, O oh, righteous father, although the world has not known thee, yet I have known thee. These have known that thou didst send me, and I have made thy name known to them, and I'll make it known that the love wherewith thou didst love me may be in them. And that's agape love. That's the kind of love we're talking about. That's what the Father wanted to do through the Son was, well, I tell you what, Brother Cobb spoke of how much the Father loved the Son. That love existed before the world began. It's going to exist long after this world is gone. And we'd never have known it unless he revealed it. In his love, God sent his son. What did his son teach us? About the father's love. Maybe we should add a verse to that old children's hymn. We all know the first verse. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Well, maybe we need another verse that declares the father loves me, this I know. For the son has shown me so. For those of us who believe the Christ, we know and experience God's love. We love because he first loved us. 
This is what's so amazing to me because this is the very same love with which he loved his son, the firstborn among many brethren. That's the same love directed towards those who are legitimate children of God. And the scriptures tell us this agape love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. In love, here's what God did. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. 1 John 3, I can, say, I can just hear John saying, just see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Amen. Now let's wrap this up. The epistle of 1 John was written to establish the truth of an individual's claim about being a child of God and being in fellowship with the saints of God. And as I said at the beginning of the message, our text deals with both sonship and fellowship. We love because he first loved us. Such divine love warrants the reciprocation of that love, the return of that love. So we do love God because he first loved us. But such a love also is going to motivate us to love our Christian brethren. We love the brethren because he first loved us. Now I want to conclude, even though I was not told anything but 1 John 4, 19, I'm going to cheat and go on to verses 20 and 21 too, and I'm not going to take much time doing it. Here's what those next two verses say. If someone says, I love God, there's one, there's one relationship, agape. If someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. The one who does not love his brother whom he's seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. This is the commandment we have from him. The one who loves God should also love his brother. See, we've got both relationships in one. But the real importance of such a motivating, compelling, willful love as agape love is that our verse can be truly broadened safely to include so much more than just God and our Christian family. You see, agape love seeks to please our spouses in more than just a physical manner. Why? Because God first loved us. Agape love, it wants to do more than just feed and clothe and, and, and protect the kids. It wants to nurture the spirit. It wants to protect the soul. Why? Because God first loved us. Amen. Agape love wants us to be more than just a good neighbor doing good works. Agape love will even extend itself to a lost and dying world. Why? Because God first loved us in such a sacrificial manner. In every situation, those who are true Christians are compelled and motivated by the love of God. 1 John 4, 17 says, By this love is perfected with us, so that we can have confidence in the day of judgment. As he is, so also are we in this world. We better be a living duplication of God's love. There are people all around us in this world who are experiencing and extending various types of worldly love. But only Christians will love as God loves. What a humbling thought that God revealed to us a greater love. What an honor to share in that which is divine. And what a responsibility to fully understand that we love because he first loved us.